You're listening to Mortgage Lending Mastery. Get the knowledge you need to advance your mortgage practice quickly and efficiently from Jen Duplessis, America's Mortgage Mastery Mentor with over 37 years of experience and over $1 billion in lifetime fundings. Jen has been mentoring loan officers and realtors for over 15 years and speaking on stages across the globe. So settle in and get ready as Jen and her guests share their experience, passion, and strategies to help you crack the top producer code to reach new heights in your business. And now, here's your host, Jen Duplessis, Mortgage Mastery Mentor and Head Chick in Charge of Kinetic Spark Consulting. Hey everyone, welcome back to this episode. My guest today, I've had so much fun getting to know him. Uh, you know, we're also in some other networking together and I've had so much fun getting to know him because what he's going to be talking about today is pretty cool. It's just the, it's the angle that he has that makes this so interesting um, in helping and building high performance leaders and teams um, right up, you know, it, one of the things I really love about this is that we do something very, very similar. It's just the mechanism in how we do it. And that's what differentiates us. And that's something that our um, listeners hear. So if you're listening to this, you, you want to hear this is a lot of times we feel like we're a commodity in what we do, but it's how you do it that differentiates you. And so you're going to hear that from my guest today, Hugh Ballou. So welcome to the show, Hugh. I'm so excited to have this conversation with you. Jen, I'm excited to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Of course. So let me just tell everybody a little bit about you. Uh, so Hugh, uh, he loves talking about orchestrating success, uh, building high performance teams. He is an exceptional uh, orchestrator, right? As someone who is a conductor of um, orchestras and symphonies. And, uh, you know, if you're watching this, you're seeing this in the background, you're seeing uh, a photo of him conducting an orchestra. And he's going to talk about how that comes together and creating beautiful music. So again, welcome to the show. I know you're, oh gosh, you know, a multiple author, you know, you've got lots and lots of books that we can talk about as well. You have a couple of podcasts too. So we want to direct everybody to go listen to your podcast as well. But let's get started with how did you start becoming a uh, conductor? Because, uh, you know, you and I've talked about this too. I played flute and piccolo and saxophone for many, many years and was in the Colorado Springs Symphony when I was in high school. Um, but I, I never had that draw to be the conductor. So why did that happen? What, what transformed that made you want to do that? Well, I've always been a possibility thinker. Um, and I studied piano as a child, and at 18, my, my first year in college, I saw this note on the bulletin board uh, in the music department, choir director position. So wow. I took it and went to the church and got the job. I had never been in a choir, so there's a barrier I broke through. I figured, I'm going to learn how to do this because I saw other people do it. I had the musical training. I was getting more education, and so I just started doing it. And so 40 years later, I, I left that profession. I've had three careers. One, I was a teacher. Um, I, and when you're a conductor, you're also educating people on what to do to raise the bar. Leaders share wisdom and empower people to raise the bar. And that's the, my, my synergy. My company is Center Vision. It's the synergy of the clarity that you get from a clarity of vision. If leaders can be very clear on what results they want, and then allow people to perform. The conductor doesn't play the instruments or sing the parts. The conductor enables people to raise the bar on the performance. So 40-year career, I learned, this is the Baloo 1090 principle. I learned that 10% of my job as music director was music. 90% was all of the stuff that made it possible. So yeah. if we're in business, we deliver a product or service, that's 10% of the total. 90% allows you to do that. And so yeah. I pretty much learned, I learned from some of the best conductors in the world, from the best leadership trainers, best facilitators. I had amazing opportunities to learn from people, but really you learn by not doing things correctly and then being able to say, mm, those weren't mistakes. Those were learning opportunities. So Jenna took everything I know as a conductor. How do you develop high performance teams? How do you get things done in a specific period of time, how do you create excellence? 
uh, transpose all those into the corporate staff, the corporate boardroom, the nonprofit boardroom. It's the same principles. Leaders lead. Yeah, and it's interesting because there's a lot of people who say, well, I lead a team or I'm a leader, you know, uh, and I know a lot of people now, uh, you know, and, and over the years, you know, through through the pandemic, et cetera, we had, you know, some of the words were leadership, you know, authenticity, et cetera. And now it's become a loose word where people are saying, well, you know, I lead. And, you know, I think that you have to learn how to manage before you can lead, but that's a whole other story. But um you know, leaders yeah. lead. And I, and I want you to, you know, for those of you listening, I want you to hear that, hear what he said. I'm kind of retracting several sentences ago, but, you know, lead, definitely leaders lead. And when you look at the 1090 principle that you're talking about, um, that I see with a lot of businesses is that they dive, the leader dives in and does the work. And, and this, for me, I share, and this is why I love you so much, because we talked about this before. I always use a symphony as an example. I have used that mm -hmm. for years, you know, is that you own the symphony. Your job is to pull people into this beautiful music that's going to be created, but you can't do that if you pull people in and then change your outfit to where, you know, in the little red outfit with the flashlight and show people the seat and then change, you know, into the conductor uh, out, you know, the tuxedo and, and raise your hands, the batons up. And then before anything happens, you change into, you know, I'm going to play flute now for a few minutes and then I'm going to go play timpani. You can't be all things. And, and this is where a lot of leaders fail is because they are, they are wanting to do everything because that's where they came from. We all emerge that way. Wouldn't you agree? We all emerge from being the worker bee we can't seem to snap out of it. So give us some, give these leaders who are listening some counsel on how do you snap out of this and stop snap doing out the of work? <laughs> yeah. In, in the words of Murray Bowen, psychiatrist who developed a system of leadership, it's over functioning. And that's the biggest flaw I see in leaders I work with on four continents doing very different things. But the consistent thing is we misunderstand leadership and you, you alluded to that. And so um, there's the boss idea. Well, spell backwards, boss is double S-O-B. You know, that's not it. That doesn't work. Um, <laughs> the conductor is perceived to be a dictator. Well, you look at That's me there. It's my better side. You see the back of me. So the dictator. <laughs> no, no. If you, if you, you got this little white stick. You see this yeah. little stick? This is yeah. a conducting baton. stick. It's yeah. a little white stick. You got union players who are professionals. They're there for two hours. They're going to play and leave. Yeah. You can you can't make them do anything because you got the stick, but you can influence them. Leadership is fundamentally about influence. Mm -hmm. Communication is about relationship. So right. underneath leadership is relationship. So you influence people when you build a relationship. And I'm standing on the podium, and that's what your feet go on podium, by the way. Um, yeah. I've got this, I got my eyes. I have very little occasion to speak. Because right. they're there to play and make music, not to hear me lecture about how it ought to go. So, <laughs> right. so many, leaders, many leaders make that, you know, the mistake of I want to do get in the micro, we micromanage people. Well, manage things, manage time, lead people. That's the Covey perspective. So we lead people by saying, here's the result I want. And when it doesn't happen, like in rehearsal, and I find many leaders don't stop and say, I want this differently. And yeah. without assassinating the personality or being hypercritical. So we stop and I say, trumpets, they're playing a loud instrument. Trumpets, that's too loud. Take it down one dynamic level. Mm -hmm. Let's do it again. So I identified the problem. I didn't attack them. I didn't say they were wrong. in the back. They're playing a loud instrument. It's up to me to say, here's the adjustment we need. Leaders do not do that. So we're contributing to the low functioning teams by not saying, wait a minute, Here's the result I need. So it's you own it. Here's what I need. They expect you to step up. And when you don't, everybody thinks poorly of your leadership. So yeah. we're not hurting people's yeah. feelings and it's not inappropriate. By the way, it's our vision and we're in charge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I akin this to, you know, um, you know, a racetrack, right? A running racetrack where we have a baton, same kind of thing, same principle, right? <laughs> a baton. And I think a, a lot of leaders um, do drive-by delegation. You know, they're throwing the baton at everybody at any point in the race, you know, they're just throwing it and people don't understand what's expected. 
and then they leave the the arena they leave the arena and leave everyone else to kind of flounder around and wonder what's going on because the the and so i'm talking about the opposing position here of well you guys should know what to do you're professionals you should know what to do and so i'm telling you what to do and i'm horrible at the way i'm explaining it and then i'm just going to leave the arena and expect that it's good and then when it doesn't they didn't win the race they come in and they they're a till of the hun right they're just slamming everybody you know oh you guys are terrible etc that's a failure in, in leadership as well. Would you agree? Oh, you're spot on. You're so spot on. We want to tell people what to do. And really, when you have to answer questions and you have to tell people what to do, you have failed as a leader. You identify the results, you give them the necessary information, and then you mentor them. When they say, okay, this or that, you ask them, what would you do? So we ask people to step up on the bar and think. Mm -hmm. So you think yourself into it and people learn by experience. Our job is to minimize the impact of the mistakes. We want to minimize that and create learning opportunities. And, you know, we need to be hands off. We want to micromanage. If I hire the very best oboe player for an orchestra and tell them how to play the oboe, they're <laughs> going to leave. Right. It's an right. And we insult people every day. So if we don't have, as a saying that if the orchestra respects the conductor, they play as the conductor intends. If they do not, they play just as you conduct. And you can't do all the little nuances. You can guide the process. So instead of doing the micro, we identify the macro, and then we guide the process, make course corrections, and we influence people to raise the bar on their own performance. So transformational yeah. leadership is about building high-performing leaders within teams. Yeah. Okay. So this, this brings up this question, you know, one of the things, uh, so my bio says that I help people build world-class teams. Okay. So that they can move from six figures to seven or seven to eight. Building a world-class team does not mean, and, and I want I want you to talk about this, right? Doesn't mean hiring someone who breathes. It, it just isn't. And I think that as leaders, what we tend to do, right? What we tend, I, for those of you that are just listening, you got to go watch what Hugh's face looked like just now when he was laughing. Um, because uh, the tendency is to not develop and develop the leadership skills, but it's morphed into, I, you know, I was an employee of widget making, you know, I was a great widget maker and now I have a widget making company and I'm still making widgets. Like you said, over performing, right. Or over doing over functioning, over functioning, over right. So I'm still over functioning, but I get to a capacity where I need to hire somebody because I can't, I, I don't have infinite time, right. I can only do a lot of this for a while, for a period, short period of time. And I have this, um, I'm over functioning. And so now it's time for me to hire someone and I just hire someone, you know, and I've heard this, I've heard this myself as I was being interviewed in, in years and years ago is, you know, I really like you. I think you would be a great fit here. Let's bring you on and we'll figure out, we'll figure out what position would be best for you. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. Right. And I hear this from a lot of leader, well, so-called leaders, right? Managers who are elevating themselves to leadership is I'll just hire them because I need help. So they breathe. And then when they don't work, we blame them and not ourselves. So can you speak to the hiring and onboarding process of bringing on world-class rock star team members? Well, you look at me, I'm on the podium. This is a concert. This is a real live concert. I get there and I raise the baton. People are ready give the downbeat. Everybody knows exactly what to do. Mm -hmm. Now, that's the tip of the iceberg. All of the infrastructure, choir, rehearse for months, the children's choir, which comes on, rehearse, had several rehearsals with the orchestra, then we put it together, and um, we build a system. There's a culture that operates within a system. On that music stand right there is the conductor's score. There's mm -hmm. a whole bunch of notes, and they go by really fast. So when I step on the podium for first rehearsal, I know everything that's going to happen because I've studied it. Right. So we create our strategic plan. That is our that is our roadmap to success. Too many leaders want to make it up as they go along. Yeah. And when you do the strategy, you're going to identify the competencies you need. So this score, I need an oboe player. I need a double, so many double basses. I need a contrabassoon. You know, it's a big old thing. Looks like a big snake. So I know the competencies I need. I've studied it. 
So if we haven't built a strategy, we don't have a roadmap, we don't have clarity of where we're going and what we need. And when you bring on people, they don't know what to do because you haven't created this, this strategy, which is an activation tool. It activates people. They know what to do, when to do. Then you go from trying to figure out, using all your energy, trying to figure out what to do to guiding the process. And it unleashes your creativity when you have the structure. So you define the competencies, you hire for competencies, you want to make sure you know the person, but if you want to lose a good friend, hire your friend. That doesn't work. <laughs> right. Yeah, people yeah. have done that too. Yeah, it's interesting. I want I want to rephrase this hire for competencies because uh, you know, as a as a mentor myself, a lot of people don't speak that terminology of competency. So I want to I want to just rephrase this um, real quickly because I want to dig into something a little bit deeper here, which is, um, you know, competencies is skill set, right? There's mindset and there's skill set, or let's just say, ability and willingness. Ability and willingness. Competency is ability. We hire for the ability to do the job, not because we like them. And in in the context of of a symphony and orchestra. Um, there's a tryout process akin to interview process, right? There's a tryout. You have tryouts and you have multitudes of oboe players coming in that have to try out for the part. Um, in my case, flute, you know, I had to try it. I would remember how nervous I was in the basement of the, or the, the conductor's house, you know, trying out for the Colorado Springs Symphony when I was in 11th grade. Can you imagine what that was like for me? It was like, oh my God, I'm good. This is big time, right? Um, and so before I went to the interview, did I practice or not? Was I prepared or not, right? But also he was prepared because he was very specifically looking for someone who could do something very specific. So talk about that because we're really talking, when we talk about competency, we're talking about someone's ability. And this is a this is an ebb and flow that happens um, in here. So how do you know? As the leader, if you're not prepared, like you said, how do you know uh, that you have someone who can perform or are they just really good at, um, uh, at trying out, but they're not really good when it comes to playing with other people? So how do you know that you're getting a good rock star? How do you know that you're getting someone with competence other than through a you know half hour interview, a half hour uh, tryout? How do you know? What are some questions that you should be asking or how do you prepare yourself for that? I know that's pretty deep, but I want people to understand this. It's both sides. It's not one-sided. It's both sides. Absolutely. When I'm <clears throat> when I'm interviewing for a job, I'm interviewing them as mm -hmm. well as them interviewing me. And that's one of the things that most, even companies that have really large departments are not very competent at doing what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. We have to be very clear. Now, some of the audition, most of the orchestras, people audition behind a curtain. Mm -hmm. So we don't have this influence of, I like you. I like, the, I like the synergy. We're, we're asking them to play certain things, sight, read something, play, you know, play this, play in harmony. You ask them to do multiple things. And then you don't settle with one interview. You have rounds of interviews. And so you <clears throat> got 10 people, you'd narrow it down to three. Then you narrow it down to one through a series of interviews. Um, some people interview really well. They're good at BS. I can, I can persuade you, you need me. And then when they get into the job, they go, oh my, what am I yeah. going to do? So it's, it's really good. The competency is the raw skill. Now yeah. we need the personality that's going to fit and we need the values and principles that are in alignment. If we're out of alignment in, in the core values, it's never going to work. Right. And and Absolutely. make a bad hire and then we don't assimilate them into the culture very well. We don't give them a chance to succeed. And so many times it's the leader that sets up the problem. For instance, I had a friend that hired one of his friends to be a marketing manager for a very substantial company. Well, a month later, no results. He goes down to his office and say, what's happening? Well, I'm working on it. Okay. A month later, what's happening? I'm working on it. Month later, I don't see any results. I'm working on it. So six months go by and he's working on it. He says, I can't fire the guy. He's my friend. He's got a family. All of this narrative that we lie to ourselves. Finally, he said, you know, this isn't working out. He said, yeah, I just can't do this. And so what he did not do is set up performance expectations. Right. This right. is 
you come on board, you know, here's what I want to do. You tell me how you're going to get there. And then we talk about it. Then I approve the plan of work. And every week we touch base. How's it going? We've got specific deliverables in a specific timeline. If we don't create that accountability, we have set up a problem. And so they have their idea what they're supposed to do. We have an idea of what we want. We haven't ever clarified. So yeah. we've set up like then we blame other people. Yeah. Finger. I call it finger pointing instead of thumb pointing. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I was thinking about, you know, a situation like this, too. Uh, you know, when I was here, I was in 11th grade. Right. And I was having a problem with I had I was the only piccolo. So I was having a problem with it with. um <laughs> Well, the Lone Ranger song, I'm going to say it that way because no one else understands the name of the song, which I, I know the overture, but, but, right. And so there's a part in there where the piccolo has like this, this crazy, you know, blah, blah, blah. and I was actually struggling with that. And, um, you know, what I loved about the conductor is now I'm now, now put yourself in this situation as you're listening to this, right. And put it, you put yourself in a work environment. And so you have someone who's not performing a specific thing. And the tendency is to just say, let's let them go. Let's let them go. Well, what happened was the conductor said to me, hey, let me work with you on this one part. Now, he could have had another team member do that. He could have had First Flute do that for me, right? And say, hey, would you work with her on this? But he came to me and said, hey, let me work with you on this because I know that every time we get to this part, it's kind of falling apart and he's had to stop the whole orchestra. And, you know, and then I'm, I'm like, oh, I feel so bad. And I practiced that part so many times. But sometimes I wasn't practicing the part because I couldn't understand the part, but I was afraid to ask the org anybody. I didn't want to show my weakness. And we have to understand that as leaders, that sometimes people don't want to show their weakness. We have to draw it out and it's okay. And so he drew it out of me and said, Hey, can we meet for a couple of days before, you know, we have practice? Let's work on this together. And it worked. Right. It worked because then I felt like I had a com a comrade in this. I wasn't all alone. So is your, is, you know, I want, I want us to apply this to, to the business of business. You think you hire a rock star, a, a perfect person, the competency level is good. And then there's an area of weakness. So talk about what you feel leaders should be doing and how they could recognize that it's not a weakness of their failure to ask that question when they were hired, but maybe, you know, we're not all perfect. How do they approach that without it being a demeaning um, but rather a, a growth opportunity. How do how do we recognize it and how do we approach it? That's that's a real common situation, and leaders do not address it because they don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. They don't right. want to point it out. <laughs> really, that person is doesn't know how to approach the topic. Remember, you're the leader. Nothing happens without leadership. If you so, I help people. We don't like to admit we have weaknesses, so I reframe them into skills in mm -hmm. gaps. Mm -hmm. When I interviewed Cal Turner for, for a book, he went, he was told me about, he inherited the presidency and CEO of a dollar general from his father. He went to his leadership team and says this job because of my genes, not my skill. You yeah. have the skills. We're going public. And he'd let them function up. He could do his leadership thing and guide the process. He said, Hugh, leadership is about fundamentally about identifying your gaps and finding good people to fill those. So when we think about people feeling, oh, I'm weak, I don't do this, I want to hide it. What what that what happened in that analogy you gave, that story you told, is he didn't point it out and embarrass you in public. He said, come on, let's work on this together. So there's a relationship building, there's yeah. nurture, the affirmation that that conductor knew that you could raise the bar, but you also came forward and you raised the bar. So we're not doing it. He didn't do it for you. He couldn't do it for you. Too yeah. many leaders give all the answers and just the, yeah, and they the say, give it to the, me, give it to me. Yeah, and then yeah. who's working late, right? Everybody else gets to go home at five o'clock and who's working late. Yeah. So when we when we give people the, the reciprocity is to over functioning is under functioning. And if we give people all the answers, they're going to keep coming for answers. And then we're the bottleneck. And if yeah. we don't allow people the chance to raise the bar on their own performance. Now, if somebody does not come up, they don't meet you in the middle. They don't show any initiative to wanting to improve. That's a different story. Yeah. But he allowed you the dignity of talking about it privately and then arranged to help you. And then you rose to the occasion. So there's both sides to that. 
Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really interesting. So what happens, how, how do you approach people like that? How, how do you approach that? It is an affirmation approach. Cause I, I do know, you know, uh, part of the management cycle, you know, is obviously keeping people motivated, keeping people inspired. It's never, you know, and, and we've all experienced a manager who comes in and goes, you're not this and you're not that whether it's in person or in public, it doesn't matter. They, because their level of frustration or the, their lack of skill as a leader is just to come down on people. How do you broach the conversation with somebody, the actual conversation for someone who's underperforming and actually have that conversation? Uh, you know, because, and, and I really want to understand, I want to understand this and help people understand this is that if you're not a good leader, you're not meeting with your team on a regular basis. And so you have not developed a relationship. So when you call someone and say, hey, I want to meet with you today at two o'clock, you have to understand what that person's receiving. You've never talked to them before. You don't have regular interval conversations with them. And now you want to meet with them. They're scared to death. And so are you because you don't have the relationship. And that's, for me, the worst thing to do, right? So I had to give some context there. But how do you actually broach that conversation? Let's assume you well, do have a good relationship, okay? <laughs> because that's the um, main problem. Yeah. Well, if you look at the Pareto principle, which is the 80-20 rule, and 80% of your results come from 20% of your people. Mm -hmm. And so you can't spend uh, your time with every single person in the organization, but the 20% you spend time with individually, they're the high performers. The 80% you relate to them in groups, you still have relationship with people. So the efficiency of the system is you group people and you have relationship and you're going to cultivate your next 20%. The, the yeah. cream's going to rise. Steve Jobs was known to walk around. He was a walk around leader. He walked around and saw what people were doing and had relationship with people. <clears throat> he might have thought it was annoying, but it was his way of building a relationship. And he said, we hire good people. We don't tell them what to do. We train them, and then they tell us what to do. So we hire people for their wisdom, their experience, their competency. You talked about, but then that's the beginning of the journey. And so singling out somebody, it, we, it's like the, the dysfunction of the annual review. We're all nervous about it because it's we know we're going to get criticized. Well, why don't you do something every week that says, hey, I noticed you did this really well. I noticed this isn't going so well. How can we, I did not say you. Once we uh, form that word you, it sounds accusatory if somebody's already nervous. Mm -hmm. And so you did this, you did this. It's like me coming down on you when I said, okay, I noticed that the results aren't what, what were we plan. How can we fix this? Because we're in this together. You're the leader, and we depend leaders on all those folks to do their jobs. And so if we open up the conversation, I notice this isn't happening. Now, we also open the door for them to tell us you weren't clear. Yes. And that's really important. That's yeah. really important. Mm -hmm. If if your group, if your team, your platoon in the in military, if your platoon doesn't respect you, they're liable to shoot you in the back in, co in combat. Mm -hmm. There's corporate leaders that get shot in the back every day. They don't even know it. Right. And so <clears throat> there's a lot of things hidden from leaders because we create this 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 barrier by not being approachable, not having relationships, and not inviting dialogue. So I, when I suggest some leaders, let's get input from people how to solve it. And they think, no, then we have to do it if they say it. No, we don't. We get information. We sort the information. They've been a part of the process. You never lose fee power, but you guide the process so everybody in the room feels like they were part of fixing the problem. And yeah. in that, you might decide that you set up a problem and then if if you're willing to admit it like cal turner says you know i got uh, i got the genes i've got the job but you got the skills he right. was very transparent we're not really transparent as leaders so if if we're going to transform organizations we begin with ourselves yeah big big I, I mean everything you said was so genius every everything you said is so genius because um you know i i think that what happens in in the transition from employee to a leader, a manager, or, um, you know, you've been a leader uh, somewhat, and then you want to be, you know, you decide that you want to own your own company. Um, sometimes, you know, and I don't know, I think it's the last thing people think about is, is 
I need to understand my PL. I need to understand, you know, the semantics and, and our process, if they're if they even do that sometimes, right? Our process and trans, you know, transcending your process to your team so that your team understands what you're expecting and actually having it written down. But the last thing that leaders do is work on their leadership. They don't go to manage, sure. they go to motivational uh -huh. events to get more business, to find more clients, to have more scale. But part of the scale is right in your, you know, I call it acres of diamonds right here on your team is the scale. They're, they're sitting there waiting, but you're crunching them. You're stepping over them. You're not shining and polishing them, you know, and, and they don't work on themselves. And I was just speaking at secret knock last week and, um, there's like, you know, 350 people in the crowd. And I said, how many of you are self-employed? How many of you are business owners, entrepreneurs? Because they all think it's different, right? How many of you think you're, you know, are sales, sales professionals? And the, everybody raised their hand at some point. Keep your hands up, right? Everybody was there doing that. Now keep your hand up if you've had formal management or leadership training. Hands go down. Formal. I didn't say leadership. I said, I didn't say, were you a good leader? How many of you have had formal training in any of that and all the hands go down? And this is why so many businesses have a lid on their business because they oscillate between I can do it myself better. I'll hire a few people. That's, that was wrong. It was their fault back to square one. And this is why they never, ever get to the goals and dreams that they expire. So what do you say about all of that? You're spot on. You're spot on. And, you know, we want to go to these touchy feely team building motivational events. Right. And as soon as we leave the room, it's over. Jim Rohn used to say, work on yourself harder than you will work on your business. Mm -hmm. And so in John Maxwell talks about the law of the lid. Yes. We can our organization cannot function any better than our ability to lead it. We hit the lid. So that's some for women, that's the glass ceiling. Yeah. Um, for others minorities it's a glass ceiling but you know i started in an industry i had no experience in and somebody recognized that i was nothing but possibility and gave me an opportunity so there's that you know we want to hire people for competency but we do have some positions where there's somebody that's got the potential and we yes. recognize potential and their willingness to grow and the further we go up that ladder the less we're willing to grow which is wrong the higher you are on that ladder, the more you need to work on your skills. Yeah. It's not like I've, I've had leaders say, oh, I don't need leadership. I've read the books. <clears throat> and I say, I bet you found the end of the internet. You've got to all of it. You know it all. <laughs> That's dangerous. That's, That's true. dangerous. Yeah. It's dangerous. It is. And, it is. and the best, you know, I'm 76. I learned the most last year than I did for my first years. And I realize now I don't know much. <laughs> There's a lot right. more to learn. Right. Yeah, we open a new door and there's a new room and a whole bunch of new stuff to learn. So always yeah. work on yourself because how you do anything is how from you Richard do Orr. How you do anything is how you do everything. I was just and, quoting that but, this morning. Oh my gosh, I was just quoting that this morning in my mind. I was yeah. saying, how you do anything is how you do everything. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I be, and I totally believe in everything that you said, you know, and I love that you're transforming people, you know, in that in that light. So that said, as we get get here at the end of our time together, Hugh, I could talk forever with you, as you know, um, and I know you have a beautiful winery and I cannot wait. You know, we've been talking about it for a while here in Virginia. We both live in Virginia and um, I'm waiting for the weather to get nice. so I can come on down. Right? It's <laughs> coming. It's coming. Bit. Yeah, it's coming. I'm I'm so excited for it. So Hugh, if someone wants to get in touch with you, what is the best way for them to do that if they want them you to be part of um their sales rally or train their management or their leadership people or they want to work with you directly? What is the best way for them to get in touch with you? If you want to know about Hugh, go to abouthugh.com. Awesome. Is that easy? Yeah, I love it. <laughs> about you.com just put it in your browser it'll take you to my link tree you got all kind of links about podcasts about my calendar all that stuff it's all one little place okay awesome what would you like to leave us with today Hugh if you think you can or you think you can't you write so if you what we learned from Napoleon Hill is the, the people that were successful had a positive mental attitude they had definiteness of purpose they surrounded themselves with competent people and they always had that positive mental attitude. You can do it. 
So equip yourself and always continue to work on your skills. Love it. Thank you, Hugh, for being with us here today. And again, I want to say thank you for listening in to um to us today i know your bit, lives are very busy it's really really important hopefully you took some great notes and you can go back and listen to this again at half speed instead of one and a half speed right listen to this again we'll call that two two time right go back and listen it instead of listening at two two time we're going to be listening at four four time we're going to slow it down a little bit get some notes in there right? <laughs> i bet you love that here Get some notes yeah. in there, um, you know, and take some action on some of this. Reach out to Hugh. Reach out to me if you have any questions. And last but not least, take a few minutes to just give us a great five-star rating and write some comments in there about what you loved about what you heard from Hugh. And last but not least, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if there are any links in here to any events that are coming up that I have, get yourself to some of these events. Start working on yourself just as much as you're working on your business. And with that, we will catch you next time. Thank you for joining. Thanks for listening to Mortgage Lending Mastery. Be sure to subscribe to hear more sales tips, ideas, strategies, and tactics to help you with your personal and professional growth to multiply your results in record time. And if you like what we're doing, don't forget to give us a rating and review so we can continue to bring you the best content possible. Wanting more beyond the podcast? Join our Mortgage Lending Mastery membership community where you will find extended interviews with our favorite guests, weekly training, tips, and insider secrets, fireside chats with Jen, free content, meet, share, and collaborate with other members, and so much more. Click the link in the show notes to learn more about this exclusive content. Mortgage Lending Mastery is an industry syndicate charter podcast. Industry Syndicate is the first podcast network specifically for the mortgage and real estate industries. Get the Industry Syndicate app in the App Store or Google Play today.